And Quincy goes, um, if you could come up with a fill, an intro fill that the whole world would forever identify with this song, <laughs> could you do that? I looked at him and I go, sure. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Go With Elmo. With me, I have the most recorded drummer in the history of time. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Jackson, Quincy Jones, The Weeknd, Madonna, Lady Gaga, Steve Winwood, Whitney Houston, Lionel Richie, and now with Elmo Lovano, <laughs> it is John J.R. Robinson. Yeah. All right, all right, all right, all right. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for being here, bro. It's a huge honor for me to have you here. Well, you know, the, there was a gondola, and I, the waters receded, and I got in. It was, it was cool. Yeah. That, that's the new Uber. It's the little water the, Uber. The water Uber, Uber. The Uber. Yeah. Took you straight here into the yeah, yeah. base. I opened the door for you and welcomed you off the boat. There it was. Yeah. And uh, man, here I am. And it's my uh, uh, distinct honor and pleasure. I, I'm so happy. I'm so happy to have you here. So... Uh, as a drummer, I've yes. been listening to you my whole life. Uh, you have played on countless hit songs. Uh, drummers know this, and a lot of the people in the music industry know this, but maybe the general consumer does not know this. But I want to start with, because ugh, I just, uh, as a drummer who always wants to write an iconic drum part, but has yet to do it, <laughs> the Rock With You intro, right? most iconic drum intro, drum fill ever in such a small amount of time. How did you write that fill? Oh, my God. So we were cutting for the Off the Wall album, uh, the song Rock With You. But um, I was very fortunate to be the mainstay drummer through the entire record. So Quincy would cast different rhythm section guys and put them around me. So I was very fortunate to play on every song. Amazing. And uh, got to play with different bass players, you know, like Lewis Johnson, um, and uh, Greg Finlegain is playing synth bass on Don't Stop. But um, it started by, after I cut a couple of songs, and then they asked me to come back and do uh, do the rest of the record on Monday. And I that basically was party weekend central before that. <laughs> got, got to the studio, boom, boom, boom. We did Don't Stop. <clears throat> and then I get asked, uh, okay, so what's your schedule like coming up? And uh, we want to get your band in and record this song and i knew quincy knew that it was a hit record written by rod temperton and the song happened to be called rock with you and we did not know it at the time but so we were all cast it was hawk walensky on keys bobby watson on bass and david williams on guitar and we were in um westlake b which uh ironically is where i cut gaga Wow. They, they wanted the exact same vibe, but X amount of decades later. But <laughs> So we go in, we start listening to Rod's demo, and Rod's very precise and simplistic and has everybody playing a specific part. Now, the drum part, no. There was no drum part. It was just motion. But like the bass part Bobby's playing, it was pretty much verbatim. However, Bobby took liberties and played the most melodic bass part of all. Not until the correct take mm. so take one i don't know i probably kind of get you know i get where i cut it with a click that i programmed and back then it was a yuri old film click seven frame film click wow and so i got the tempo blah 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 we start rehearsing and then we okay we're ready to cut so take one and eh, no magic you know okay well let's do it again okay Little Phil, whatever. Take two. Eh, maybe a little better. People are learning their parts. Time's going on. I'm looking in the control room, and I can see Quincy and Rod in there. Rod's puffing on his red Marlboros. And uh, take three. A lot better. No magic. And we're sitting there, kind of in the studio, in a small room. And I see Quincy get up and Rod get up and come out of the door, and Quincy stands right by me. And I'm going, oh, shit. And Rod's standing right here, smoking his Marlboros with his English accent. And, and Quincy goes, um, JR, he goes, um, if you could come up with a fill, 
an intro fill that the whole world would forever identify with this song. <laughs> Could you do that? And may, maybe on this next take. And uh, I looked at him and I go, sure. <laughs> like, like John Belushi, like, <laughs> and, and, and all the guys are like going like this to me and like going, Oh fuck. You know, like, no pressure, no pressure. What are you going to do? And, and, and little did they know that they are going to be put in the exact same amount of pressure because of what's going through my brain. But I didn't know what I was going to do. So I immediately, I, I reflected back to the rod demo, which was, it was weird. And then I thought, what do I hate most about drum fills? I hate when the, the, let's just take two examples. One is straight 16th notes and triplets or putting them together is just wrong. Yeah. It's wrong. And so I go, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> but I did it more in a, a syncopated march world. So then, then uh, okay, I got ready to take four. Let's go. And all of a sudden I hear four clicks and then I have to go. So the four clicks were click, 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 click. And, and I just did that, but I used my military training, my march training, and I added syncopation, and I made sure there was a hole that you could drive an 18-wheeler through to get to the next downbeat. But it all came spontaneously. In that one take. And I was like, thank you, God. In that one take. And then we never did another take. No way. That was it. That fill set the magic for the whole take. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, everybody's playing differently. Bobby's bass line is completely different than the other three takes. Because you hit that downbeat and everyone's like, ooh. That's what it was. And, and Quincy knew oh. they were up dancing and shit and was like, rot in a rot. It was great. It was great. You know, and then blah, 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 blah. So that was... And then we kind of knew we had cut a number one record. Oh. Which is, I have people asking me, and I, you know, I am working on my book now. Yeah. Which would be a 2024 release. But Amazing. I have this, this is being thought about, uh, about how do you know that? How do you think about that? Yeah. So it's like all of us looked at each other and we go, we did it. Wow. That's so much pressure and you did it in one take, it just came out of you. And there was no pressure the minute that... I guess the minute the fill happened, but it was really the downbeat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, as a drummer, man, when you land on that downbeat, I mean, there is, that's, that's word. Yeah. I love that that's one take and it wasn't this like perfectly written or articulated thing or it wasn't Quincy walking in being like, can you do something kind of like stupid? No, like, no. I, I mean, in other like, sessions, Quincy's come in with a little piece of music and he written out some fills for me for other stuff and I'm, you know, and his penmanship was just perfect. Yeah. You know, it was the real deal. For sure. And I go, you really want me to play that? And he goes, yeah, play that. You know, anyway, but not on this one. Oh, my God. So you knew you had a hit. 100%. And is there vocal on that? Is there a demo vocal? Is there a Michael demo vocal when you're cutting those songs? I don't believe there was a vocal on that. That's just, a great question. Just an instrumental. But I know he had been working on it way before I even got on the scene. Right. Uh, through Rod, but it, it's Rod is always he was very precise. Yeah, about all his records, they, they, everybody had a. It was like a team, you know. So, so on that bad album, is Michael? Yeah, is he there with Quincy and Rod and you, or is 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 it like in and out? Yes. Sometimes it's yeah. Like what is what well, was it like? First of all, there's multiple multiple versions of Mike. I can imagine. You know, the beginning Mike, which was Rock With You Days. Yeah. A real pretty man. Yeah. Uh, shy, you know, and then, you know, we get through, uh, you know, the Thriller Days, and then you get to uh, the uh, We Are The World Days, and then you get to Bad. Bad. Things started transforming. But he was, Quincy was allowing him to write more. If you ever notice, there's not Michael Jackson songs on the record off the wall. Mm. There's co-written. Mm. So he started to write more, like bad. Mm -hmm. Quincy was allowing him to grow up. Yeah. and uh, But Mike was there. And I, it was during the heyday of, of when we were all uh, doing our jobs, all the studios at Westlake were, were filled with somebody. So thank God I had the... I had D, the big room for the drums, and a big old ass rack of bullshit <laughs> that I would trigger with a Mac sitting on it. Like, hold, yeah, hold on, let me let me program that. And there's really nothing there. Yeah, 
you know, but, but Quincy wanted electronics, but Mike was there and he would offer suggestions finally. Yeah. You know, which, you know, down to the end days of Michael, uh, he would produce from his car. Oh my God. He would like call me and goes, Oh, JR, uh, don't forget to put a fill going into the bridge. I really want a specific fill and I'll call back after you do it. I go, okay, why don't you just come into the studio? Tell me what to do. Yeah. No, uh, oh, no, no. I know you know what to do. You know. Wow. Anyway. What, what was it like working with Michael Jackson? I'm very blessed. Um, I know that they had been cutting post-Ben with some L.A. players, and but nothing was sticking. Mm. And I think Greg Filmagains was still a common denominator. Mm. And um, But Quincy wanted something different. Yeah. And uh, that's where this whole convergence happened at, during Off the Wall with Jerry Hay, with Rod Temperton, with um, uh, Gary Grant, Larry Williams, Lewis Johnson, um, Greg Fillingaines, Bobby Watson, this, this, all these other people at Patty Austin, they all converged. It was just kind of a meant-to-be thing. So working with him was great. After we had cut Off the Wall, I'm green. It was like, my, I've done records, but that was my, I mean, we had done Rufus records, but they weren't big like that. And I asked Quincy, can I be a fly in the wall and stick around for the whole process? Because I didn't know. I was just 23 or 4 years old. Mm. And he goes, sure. So I'm, I'm like sitting back, and then I'm watching Michael sing, and all of a sudden you hear <clears throat> you hear his feet coming through the mic. And so Bruce Swedeen, just the genius engineer, goes, well, we, I have to fix this uh, somehow. So he built some sort of platform that Michael could still dance while he sang, but you didn't hear it. And so I would sit wow. there, like a fly in the wall and listen. I'm a Berkeley guy, by the way. Man, I'm smart. I'm a piano player. I know all this harmony. So I'm listening to Michael layer his parts. And I go, well, that's really cool. And then this note's really cool. And then the third note, no, no, this note's a half step off, man. And I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it wrong. And then all of a sudden, Mike takes a break and puts the fourth note on. I go, oh, I'm an idiot. I was wrong. And he had, I was like listening to him layer and, and just the whole concept of, of uh, you know, us drummers, when we, we, you know, we basically lay down, we're building the house from the bottom up. Yeah. With hammers and nails and stucco and, you know, whatever, blocks and mud. And, and then we get to a point and we leave. But we don't ever stay around for the whole record process. Right, right. So I, I, I learned a lot that, you know. First one in, first one out. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, not, Sometimes. <laughs> not Nile Rogers used to fuck with me and say, yeah, you know, the New York against L.A. vibe. Yep. He'd go, yeah, JR just leaves his car running. <laughs> I go, well, that's not true. Be like, I mean, I wrote the Rock With You riff in one take. Yeah. Recently, and I said, well, don't you want me to leave? What am I doing here? No. You want me to order lunch? Yeah. You want me to yeah. hang around? No. <laughs> But I can imagine that your relationship with Michael and, of course, with Quincy, because you've done so much with Quincy. But just to stick on Michael for a sec before we move to Quincy, like, it, it so much grew because, you you know, from you doing, like, I Can't Help It or doing, like, Rock With You and doing these early, you right. know, late 70s Michael songs compared to doing Bad in the 80s and having it be electronic and big and triggered sounding and, like, all this stuff. Yeah. Like, so, A, your evolution of your drumming and drum tones and everything grew so much in those eight years, but also I'm assuming you're collaborating with him and your relationship with him, right? And your trust and everything with him. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he was, um, the team was assembled. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and God bless Lewis Johnson, who, who was mostly the bass chair. Mm. And uh, unfortunately he, he passed, but, and so did David Williams mm. passed, but, um, we had this beautiful team. And after uh, David Williams left, Steve Lukather came in. You know, you think, Steve, look at that. <laughs> no, he's playing this inside R&B, hippest parts ever stuff. So he, all right, you're good. All right, you're in the band, you know, and that kind of thing. This is like, we don't care about Toto. It's, we care about making these records. And uh, so Mike was really, um, it, it was like, yeah, he had this band. He had the studio band, you know. I mean, this whole live thing was completely circus orchestrated, you know, but uh, and good. But uh, the studio band was like camaraderie. Wow, dude. All right, so 
you have now 2023 big year for J.R. Robinson, 50 years in music. At, at least. <laughs> at Actually, least. it's 60 years playing drums, but we're going to go 50 years, uh, 50 years in the industry. I love that. And I, I love this. You are the heartbeat of the hits. Yeah. And I, I love that. I love that. And so if you were to think about each decade, is there a standout session from like each decade that you could tell a story wow. on that would really kind of, you know, it would, it would show, I mean, it'll show so much. Cause I mean, early on with you, with, uh, with Rufus and yeah. Chaka and De Quincey or De Quincey with that, which then brings you to Michael, like, is there a standout with each? Yeah, there's good and bad. Yeah, so <laughs> let's I'll, take I'll it. I'll try to do this quick. Uh, when I first joined Rufus and Shaka, um, I finish out the 78 World Tour uh, kind of infatuated with Shaka because who the hell wasn't? Yeah. And uh, we hung, and she immediately said, I was so happy. I'm so happy to be in this band with you. Oh, John, I'm, I'm leaving the band. Oh... I so it was it kind of broke my heart, but okay, what do you do? She goes, you can come with me. Ooh, and I'm thinking, well, that's not guaranteed. Yeah, but the five guy, four guys are guaranteed. So no, I'm sticking with the guys. Blah blah blah. We do a solo record called Numbers, which I brought Freddie Hubbard in, and and uh, it was kind of a breakout record for me as a studio drummer because I I was still playing like. Billy Cobham, like mm. really loud and fast. Yes. And the stuff that nobody wants on records. And um, and I came in and our engineer producer was Roy Halley from New York. And Roy Halley was Simon and Garfunkel's producer. You know, Bridge Over Troubled Waters. Yeah. So Roy was our guy. He had his 911 in there. It was a 935. And it, and it had his 930, 30. And he had a Ferrari parked inside the studio. And I'm going, oh, geez. But... I'm playing, and I realize through not understanding about mic sound pressure that I'm playing too hard. Mm. Not understanding what the mics that are on the drums, what their limits are. And I'm supposed to know that, but I didn't. So I was educated and got really good at it. So that, that numbers record, when you listen to it, it's great, mm. but it's, I'm green. Yeah. Uh, even though the playing is fantastic. And then... So we go on, and then you know the more more time spent in the studio, you know, with Quincy or uh, Rufus or uh, just other people, then Diana and and Lionel and all the people I started working with before we did Ain't Nobody was great. So all right, I would say just something off that numbers record was education time. Yeah, yeah, uh, which was still on ABC Dunhill. We were stepchildren with the Crusaders, Steely Dan, and Steppenwolf. Mm, wow. And they didn't know what to do with us. Wow. And I go, okay, we all ended up getting absorbed by MCA, which in those days was Music Cemetery of America. <laughs> then, you know, that's obviously different now. It's you know, Everything's universal. But, all right, so then the 80s come. The, obviously, anything off, off the wall was freaking gold. Yeah. And... Um, uh, you know, I, I, I lean towards rock with you only because uh, it allowed me to, you know, nobody believes it's me. Like, if I go into some really weird urban club, they go, that's not you. I go, oh, fuck, fuck, whatever. <laughs> I think, you know, when I'm dead and gone, it's hopefully in 22 years, I'm going to put a little button on my gravestone with that sample. <laughs> yeah. It's the soundtrack of you. Yeah, uh, anyway, so uh, the 90s, well, 80s were really good to me. There was a point where I was on 10% of the 100. Wow. And, you know, beginning with Lionel and... Uh, of the Hot 100? Yeah. Yeah. And then, I, you know, I, the Steve Winwood stuff jumps out. I mean, all the Lionel stuff, the pointers, it, it all... Pointer we sisters. are the world. Yeah. Which was, what, 50-some million units sold. Um, and you're playing on all the single, the hits, the I'm so excited, like all I'm the... I'm so excited, yeah. which was a great band, by the way. Holy mackerel, that was a great band. That track slams. And and who thought about it up tempo thing yeah. like that? So, but make you dance. I used to dance that song. When I was, sorry, but when I was in diapers. So you had the you had the the groove. Yeah, I had it. Oh yeah, my oh, you do a little shame. Oh for sure, my shame. dad my dad raised me on that kind of on that like from from Deep Purple to the Pointer Sisters. Like, Fantastic. Like we were we were ripping. I had a little plastic little play school drum kit when I was three, and I would just carry it to whatever room my dad was playing the music in, and I would just. Just like play to it. Was he a musician also? Yeah, my dad plays guitar and oh, keys. Fantastic. My my family does on both sides. Like my dad's side, 
uh, is rock and roll. They both play guitar, my dad and his and his brother, my uncle Jerry. And then on my mom's side, it's mostly jazz, all horn bass, like oh. my cousin Joe Lovano. And there's yeah, a, I know a, Joe. Yeah, yeah. There's a, b- a bunch of horns and and more jazz and on my mom's side. Well, it's funny. It's my, when I was a little boy, you know, my dad started me on piano at age five, which is too soon. Yeah, and, and I was like, I hate this because mathematically you're not ready. But at the same time, my mother is sitting me in a corner playing me big band records. And telling me about what the word swing means. Yeah. And this is Gene Krupa. Yes. This is Buddy Rich. This is Zooty Singleton. I don't know if she actually knew that or not, but, you know, <laughs> well, let's assume she did. Yeah, she probably did. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, and like I'm from Southwest Iowa, so Glenn Miller was a big deal. Yeah. You know, he was from near where I was from. So I got that same swing thing from my mother. That's awesome. Yeah, which is still in my brain today. That's so cool. I mean, you've done so many of these like iconic drum fill intros. Even the "I'm so excited," all the Steve Steve Winwood. Hi, Steve oh, Winwood. I, yeah, I got I got away with about twelve to fourteen seconds there. Yeah, I know it's <laughs> long <laughs> today. Today, you know, I always use use that as a it's a DJ setup. Yeah. You know, hey, ladies and gentlemen, you know, it's like a seventy three degrees in the city. You know, here's the new single by Steve Winwood. Think about it. You know, it's like, oh, you know, <laughs> in, in today's times, it's like, boom. Yeah. Duh. Dude. I know. I know. Duh. Cut the drummer something off. <laughs> I love that. And there, and I love that you put a drum intro on it, and, you're like, and it's the single, and it leads the album. Let's get it. Bing. And we, we won uh, Record of the Year, and uh, it was uh, Russ Tadman produced that. Duh. Who also produced uh, Ain't Nobody in our live record. Ain't Nobody. Yeah. So many singles. <clears throat> I got a Grammy for that. I'm yeah, very, you did. I'm very, very blessed. Yeah, yeah fuck. You know, back, when, <laughs> back when bands were bands, and you know, hopefully next year we'll get in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with Rufus. That would be amazing. We've been nominated seven times collectively. Is, there's a committee, like a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame committee, that votes on it. They, some sort of they may they may be. I'm not. Sh- I'm not. I'm going to be kind. Yeah. Twenty three will be a kind year. I'm sure it'll work out. Let's not wait. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Let's not worry about it. No, I'm not even going. All to we know is that think about we, it. Committees control everything. They, um, they do. <laughs> I, I I I don't understand. You're going to get it. Okay, wait. Because I was going to say. You're still doing hits. I mean, even now with the weekend and with Daft Punk, but I don't want to jump to that because we were still in the middle. I think we, the oh, '80s were good to you. '80s were really good to me. Yes, uh, because look at. I mean, I'll, I'll put a punctuation on this. '80s were really good. <clears throat> excuse, excuse me. Uh, to me, to songwriters, to record labels, yeah. to artists, and to everybody that's greasing the wheel. Yeah, everybody got paid and everybody did well. And. Um, it was. It built the solidity of our what our unions about about how musicians, bands, and then then grunge came. Yeah, and I actually had a record deal on uh, WTG CBS in '89 with a guy named Mark Williamson, and we were Blue Eyed Soul. It was called Bridge Too Far. We had two hits, but CBS put their money behind Richard Marks. Wow! So it's like okay, Lionel threw us our party. It was wow. it was really cool. It was a great record. It's called Bridge Too Far, and uh, I had all the uh, I had Luke with her and Paige playing on it, and Neil and, and all sorts of really cool people, Jerry A and Gary, and uh, but then the '90s came and grunge happened, and all of a sudden drummers are using hi hats as crash cymbals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute. I was taught by Ed Sof that you don't do that. And you're supposed, you know, they're hi hat symbols. They're not crash symbols. Well, apparently they're crash symbols now. And uh, okay, yeah, put them, put them up here, put them up here, and just open them up, <laughs> open them up, and rip. Yeah, it, that's why. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I, 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 all right. And all of a sudden, engineers' roles changed. You know, sonics changed. Yeah, drum sounds totally changed. Yeah. and which we fought hard in the '80s to get the drums bigger. Uh, from, Which is noticeable from the Eagles days in the seventies. Yeah, because even if you just listen to um, Rock with You, if you just go straight from Rock with You to Bad, it's, I mean, everything from the master volume to everything in the drums. Oh, like if you are on the same volume, it just hits you in the face. But one thing about I'm yeah. regressing again, but yeah. uh, the Off the Wall album was all analog. Mm. But if you if, if course, you look yeah. at the levels, that it holds up. Yeah, it's one of the only uh, analog records it does. 
All right, so okay. grunge, grunge, grunge. All right, so I don't know what These I did. These fucking kids from Seattle come in with their crash hi-hats. Look at them. What the hell are they doing? And unkempt hair, oh, according to my mother. Yes. Uh, even though there were some really great songs yeah. they did. But, um, you know, and I did, uh, I'm not, I guess I am proud of it. I, I did a lot of Wilson Phillips hits during oh. the 90s. All number one records, all, nice. all women won it. Amazing. Uh, even though when I'm hanging with Carney and she goes, John, I just got a brand new BMW. I go, really? I work Capital. I go, okay, let me go look at it. She's got a brand new 850. And I'm going, do you even know what you got? She goes, no, it just looked pretty on the lot. There it is. I have the keys. <laughs> so anyway, go to that. But the, one of the greatest songs was uh, Eric Clapton's Change the World. Oh. And that was Babyface. Yeah. Uh, produced and... That was an interesting story. Um, I was really sick, and I got the call from Kenny, and we went down to Record Plant D. I had all my drums set up. I got there early. We got the sounds. Nobody showed up. Then finally I see Kenny walk in, and uh, and we talked about the song, and then Dean Parks walks in, and it was just us three. So I sat with Kenny, you know, baby face, and watched him play this demo on acoustic guitar uh, and program the click. And, and he goes, no, no, we got to come back one. But it, I was doing it all in Pro Tools. Yeah. And we finally got the right tempo. Dean and him sat there for two hours playing it with each other. Finally, Dean went out and cut it with my click. That's it. And then he goes, all right, you ready? You know, so I put the drum part down, went home. Nathan came in, put the bass part down. Michael Thompson came in, put the electric down. Greg Fillingans came in and put the piano, Rhodes, and B3 part down. Then Louis Conti came in and put the perk down. It sounds like everybody's playing live, but it wasn't. Wow. And then it won Song of the Year Grammy. I, I thought that that was tracked live. Everybody yeah. did. Yeah. But that was just, I think, the brilliance of the, the team. Yeah. You know. So then the 2000s came. And I, start, I started working with Barbara in 1993, 94. And a lot of people go, why are you doing that? I go, you know why? Because it's the best large orchestra band in the world. Yeah, Barbara Streisand. And um, um, we started doing her first. We opened up the MGM Grand with Kerkorian in uh, 93 December. Wow. And uh, for New Year's Eve. And this hotel wasn't even done yet. And then uh, I got to fly over a week early because in her contract and m mine and Marvin Hamlish was then conductor, they had to rehearse a dummy orchestra in Vegas in case there was a plane crash from Burbank to Vegas, which is... Uh, what? Yeah, it was, it was in her contract. So I flew over early. Hell, it was my birthday time anyway, so I partied that whole week in <laughs> Vegas and played with the orchestra every day. And you know, all the parts ironed out. Then they, they reprinted them, and then the rest of the band came over from L.A., and then we, we did that first opening with her. But the, her gig continued every year, every couple of years. We went to Australia, and it ended around 2014. And there was some really good bands, and all, some of the hardest stuff I've ever done in my life. Wow. Like, way harder than anything you can imagine. So, But I, I did it. It was interesting. Um, you know, I, I, I always tell one story. She would not really care about money, even though management did. Yep. And she would be, be the lighting LD guy would be lighting her gowns, and she'd have a come out while the orchestra is being paid, and model her gown in front of the orchestra, but in front of the lights. And I just go. <laughs> I'd play stripper groups for her. <laughs> and she just turned around and goes, oh, JR. And then she'd start flailing and shit. So, I mean, it was, she was fun. The power of the groove. Power of the groove, man. It, it shake, shake that booty. <laughs> shake it. It changes the whole energy of everything. That's, isn't that our job? Yeah. Yeah. You know? And it's your job to be intuitive to know, even if she doesn't even know it yet, that I'm going to play that right now. And make, exactly. let's, let's make this fun instead of just everyone sitting here. Right, it's testing it, lights on a dress. Life is too serious. It, yeah. it it shouldn't be serious. It should be fun. Yeah, she seems fun. She's yeah. she's she's a she, well, let's just leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
2023, the year of the amazingness and the niceness and the calmness oh, the and, niceness. The beautiful, and the supportiveness and the lovingness. Oh, I got to go backwards. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, rock and roll. I got yes. in, I got in at the tail end of heavy, the Eagles world. You yeah. Know? Actually, I was with Glenn Fry and yeah. for a year, but I learned about everything, which will come out in the book. But, uh, you know, in the old days, it was, you know, it was, it was smoking pot and doing cocaine and blah, blah, blah. And so when I got in the Streisand band, what do you think they were doing? Flossing. Everybody was flossing together. I go, boy, this shit has really come full circle. <laughs> it's a different culture. It's a different. <laughs> I'm addicted to flossing. I have to go to Flossing Anonymous. Oh, wow. But anyway, so that was, I had to regress. Sorry. An interesting little t- little tip. Yeah, tip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's nice. Okay, so then the 10s, 2010s. The, the 10s. Was that the 10s right now? No, that was 2000s. You know, in the meantime, I had been, uh, started working, you know, my dear brother, David Foster, who uh, is not a household name, uh, Canadian guy from Victoria, who had a band called Skylark. And they had a number one record. They were on Midnight Special. That's how old they were. And But he got uh, into the United States and became a session player, a ranger, then a producer. And I started working with him in 1981. Mm. Uh, and the first record I did with him was Bill Champlin's Runaway. Bill Champlin, of course, was from Sons of Champlin out of the Bay Area. Great rock band, a cultish kind of band. Um and then David ended up hiring him for Chicago. But um, so we started doing sessions together. We did Through the Fire together. We did Just Once, all number one records. Uh, he, he was part of it. We did Fee Waybill. We did all sorts of just really cool shit. But around 95, he decided to start uh, David Foster and Friends or whatever it was. And we started working with Andre Agassi. And we built, and, and I became incredibly close with Andre. And, and what we were doing was raising money for his charity to build a school system in Las Vegas for the underprivileged. Mm. But you, you still had to have a 3.85 to get in, uh, not the little kids. So he had a kindergarten uh, through five, and like six through nine or, or something like that, and then a high school. And it's all this huge conglomerate building that nobody could see. So every year we'd do something. Every year. And, and, and our, we'd always have uh, Robin Williams would be on the show. Uh, Elton would close the show every year. And uh, there'd always be some political uh, mismatch with like Dennis Miller, and, and it would it'd be fantastic. Robin throwing shit out. It was fantastic. And uh, we're playing all this stuff. And then it finally came to a head, uh, and we moved out of the MGM and went over to the Wynn, did two years at the Wynn, and then it was self-sufficient, so that ended. But that took David into this live platform. Yeah. uh, Because Chicago was done, everything was done, uh, Whitney was done, Celine was done from his perspective. Um, He was still doing things. Like every time you go by the Bellagio and see the fountain, You'll hear my cymbal swells. No way. Yeah, boy, I make <laughs> so much money from that. I was like, you keep me on. Not. Gonna... <laughs> I was going to say. Uh, oh, no, no. But uh, it's just, you know. You're boy. even on the cymbal swells of the Bellagio fountain. The Bellagio. That is hilarious, forever. dude. And, and I know. Well, you know. <sighs> uh, so we started taking this live, and we started first touring, and we started doing uh, the Hitman shows, I think around 08, and we did three PBS specials were all incredibly successful, where he'd just call his buddies, yeah. and, and it'd just be a calv- cavalcade of hits. And so it's a huge, div- diverse book. Yeah. And then we took it on the road to Asia in 2010. And that was the beginning of, and it was some really cool. Sh- we'd, every year we went to... Asia. We're actually, I'm going to Manila coming up in a couple of weeks again. Nice. And then, um, I'm going to Ireland with David in a couple of weeks. Amazing. But, uh, which we've never took, taken him to Europe. So, you know, and we'll see. And I get my own little two to three minute, like three minutes in the middle. That's the JR medley. And then we have people guess what the six songs are and they're all number one records. That's and, awesome. But it's like, okay, finally, you know, it's like, okay, I'm not just a side man with him, but I do it. Cause he always asks, why do you, st- why are you still with me? Yeah. 
And I go, you know why? Because I love your music. Yeah. And it's fun to play after the love is gone or uh, uh, the Whitney tunes I've played on that he wrote. Or, yeah. You know, um, it's just fun. And I do it. And, and it's, you know, in these times, you know, and with, with I'm sure we'll bring up the SRT. Um, of course. Form, forward mo- momentum. But I still do the David stuff because it's, it's almost like why I did Streisand. Yeah. You know, it just keeps you on your toes, you know, yeah. and not every night is the same song. Everything changes. Mm. So you got to be, you know, it's not just 12 songs or 20, it's 50. Yeah. So you got to know them. 50 and a lot of hits. A lot of hits. <laughs> yeah. And then was it, um, so, and then you, you get into now doing, uh, or be, most recently having the weekend. Right. Uh, the weekend hit. The f- I feel it coming, yeah. Yeah, I feel it coming, which is... Which came out of Daft Punk recording session. That's what I was going to ask. It yeah. was it was kind of weird. Which it, also came from Nile Rodgers. Was that like the tie? The, was that no. what brought... Was it separate than that? Yeah, we did it. That This is way after the huge record. Yeah. And we got Nathan and I, and I think Paul Jackson, got called into uh, Henson D, mm-hmm. a room way in the back. Love that room. I love that room, love too. Love that room, that's yeah. A, that's a... You know, A is obviously... You know, we are the world the singer world, world but, uh, you know, I, I did, <laughs> regressing, I did Ray Charles's last song ever in A. Wow. And that was called, it was Elton John duet, Sorry Seems to Be the Hardest. <laughs> Amazing. And that was Ray's last, uh, and a quick story, and then I'll go, go to the other. Uh, Ray came in after we had cut, and the, the, the he insisted to the producer that uh, it had to be at 60 BPM, 6.0. And I was like, okay, all right, it feels laggy because I'm not hearing Ray or Elton. So I, I talked the producer into, like, well, let's do one at 62, which felt good, but again, we didn't hear the, the vocals. Yeah. So the next day, Ray comes in, and uh, or later that day, I forgot, and, and his last name is Robinson, by the way. Ray Charles' is last name? Yeah, Ray Charles Robinson. Oh, wow. And uh, his daughter was there, and, and we, we hung out and talked. And and then uh, I, I think it was like maybe we, we were cutting, right? He was there, and then he left. And he looked back on his way out, and he, he can't see. And he pointed at the uh, producer, and he goes, it better be 60. He knew. And he knew and turned around and walked out. And that was the last I ever saw him. Oh. And then, then you hear the record, and it was like, oh, my God. God, you know, you just freaking tearjerker, you know. But <laughs> but that same studio, back in D, uh, working with the Daft Punk producers at that time, this is the next generation record after we did the good one. Uh, they always, and Mick Gazowski's engineering, another just legend, and they had me tunneled in like I was freaking camping out at Big Bear. Yep. And I go, like, how do I get in here? In the back right corner? Yeah. Is that where they put it? Yeah, with D? shit everywhere yeah. in there. I'm going, I mean, I, I listen, I could have I could have brought a, a, a shower curtain yeah. and add more reverb. <laughs> dead drums. Dead drums. You could barely get in there. <laughs> I see dead drums. <laughs> um, God. Hits. Dead yeah. hits. By the way, that took me a second to understand recording dead drums. Mm. You know, and... Uh, Things like Ringo knew, yeah, somehow, yeah, or, or you know whomever. But all right, so they asked me to just go in and start looping shit, you know, playing, yeah. And so that's how that song came about. The weekend song, yeah. the I feel it coming, yeah, really. And that's how several songs on the Daft Punk record came. Was that you looping just you on the drums, or you with the with the band? both both? Yeah. I, and I didn't know if they were coinciding because there yeah. was you know they, they're listening. And they're going, what are we getting? And then Mick's probably chiming in from the control room, like, wow, this is really cool. We could use this here. And they're probably going, well, I've got um, I got a BPM of uh, between 96 and uh, maybe 124 that does this fit into. Yeah. And we're going to write a song. So lesson learned, and I tell my students this, I go, if you're on a sampling session, make sure it, you know it's a sampling session. But... If that sampling session turns into them using you and, and you got a hit record out of it, then you're you're entitled to writers. Yeah. Well, that's hard to do. Right. 
It's hard to do. And you got to prove it somehow too. Yeah. Or you got to know if they don't tell you. Yeah, and they don't. Yeah. You know, so that's very, I mean. So how did you find out or how did you? Well, I'm listening to the original Daft Punk record and I'm going, wow, this is some really cool shit. And I go, but I don't remember 60% of this going down this way. Because I knew they were all in there, and they're just little rocket scientists yeah. putting shit together. Yeah, you're tracking, and they're cutting. Yeah, or yeah. or they send Nathan out of the room, and Paul, you guys take a break. So, JR, just start playing. Why don't you play at 116 for a while? No, now, don't play 16th notes now. Yeah. Now, just do that. Now, just, now, 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 make your bass drum less syncopated. Okay. Meanwhile, it's record, record, record. And they're just sucking your soul oh. out. The beast. <laughs> now, thank God that record was record of the year. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, and you got your credit. Got credit, yeah. and, we, and we actually got compensated well. Amazing. So... As uh, you should. Well, yeah, okay. But, you know, it's been a long career. Right. A lot to fight for. Oh, my God. And there's been a lot of, as we called it, polishing a turd, you know, uh, songs. Or that guy that just got out of Berkeley. Yeah. That's written everything <laughs> in his first song. Yeah, <laughs> everything ever in his first song. That's oh, so true. <laughs> um, okay, so if we could go back into Quincy um, yeah. for a moment. Shouts to Quincy. You know, Quincy Jones is jam card investor. Well, he's a genius. He's a genius. And by the way, I have been signed to jam card for three years since you started. I remember when you got on, Christian, who's right here on the camera, we uh, our head of community, director of community right here. Yeah, I think, I don't remember if you hit me up or if I hit you up, we like saw in the database you got on, I was like, duh, G.R. Robinson's on. <laughs> I was like, we're making it. We're a real thing. <laughs> well, good. What comes around goes around. This yes, for sure. I remember, I, I, like, you, it was a big moment for me when you got on the platform. You got on, like, Harvey, Harvey Mason Sr. got yeah, on, and yeah. then Harvey Jr. got on too. And, and there was a lot of things for me because pre Jam Card, I was a drummer, musical director, right? Like, right. that's how I was making my living. That's what I was doing. I wasn't a tech guy. I had never built a tech platform before. I've I'd thrown a lot of concerts and a lot of jam sessions. So I was, I was doing that around LA, but I had never made like a tech platform. So all of a sudden, when we built it and then it came out, there's been a lot of moments where like Christian and I will hit each other like, oh, so and so just got on. We're like, whoa, <laughs> high five. See? And you were and you were a big one. Well, you know what? The platform it it it's it was different than all those other ones. You know, and it looked like it would give um you know I, I'm you know, A listers, B listers, and C listers. It would give everybody a chance to do something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think that's that's good. And certain other I'm going to not even comment on our background of the LA music industry. Yes. So, but it's, it's good to see the future. You know? Yeah. A, a big thing for us is just making sure that people are making their living in music and then we let them on the platform. So whether it's, you're making just enough to get by, you're still a professional and you're still on growing your career. Right. Or if you're an A-lister and you're like, well established, that's an obvious, right? right? Right. So we don't, so we, we don't let just, you know, anybody on, but we make sure that you've at least established yourself or begin to establish yourself. You have some in, you have income coming in and you're like, you're on the hustle. Right. Drums or songwriting or producing or guitar or whatever it is. Or we even have like engineers, right. both live sound engineers and, and recording. Oh, that's good. Tour managers and all this stuff too. So it's, that's, that's like a big thing that we try to look, that's what our goal and what we look for in our vetting process to then get people on and then hope that we can help them grow their career, get them opportunities. Cause it's like, a gig that's right for you isn't right for that up and comer or the gig that's for the up and comer, you're not going to take. Right. So it's like finding the right opportunities and fitting them into the right places. Right. And, and you know, I've had, I was probably one of the first of the modern generation, I say from 79 to always have a studio, mm -hmm. you know, even my first studio was a freaking Porta studio. Wow. And learned about, Oh my God, you can, you, you can squash a cassette. Yeah. Ah! You know, but then came in, and then I have an MX-80, and then I had all this stuff, and now my studio, I just basically took over my downstairs of my home, and it's great. That's awesome. And it sounds, to me, as good as Capital. And what, what percentage of the sessions that you're doing these days are you at home engineering uh, versus you in, in a Capital? Or in that's a, a great question, because pre-COVID, and I always said, you know, all right, if I'm, if I'm working at home at 25%, yeah, uh, and, and working out and working in Hollywood... That means I'm keeping the Cartage Company working uh, with uh, the other drummers. Yep. And I got, I, I have, you know, time to learn 
and grow. Well, then, you know, pre, right before COVID, that started to go up to 50%. And then with COVID, the thing just turned over. So the majority of my sessions are out of my house. Yeah. Which it just told, it was a flip, man. Yeah. But, I, so we got better. My engineer is Steve Sykes, but I've got a, a, a Yamaha DM2000. So, it, you know, it's a four or five page and you got to really know what you're doing. And yeah. they made the greatest console uh, 15, 17 years ago. Uh, it still holds up to anything today. It's got great mic pre's, even though I have, uh, I don't have a lot of external stuff, but I do have to know how to get around. And Steve moved to Fort Collins. Yeah. Uh, and so when he comes in, we do tweaks. And if I'm going to add a different mic uh, thing, but uh, I don't go, I know a lot of drummers in Los Angeles that have just racks of shit. Yeah. And it's garbage. Yeah. I don't care what brand it is. You know, you got to have a really simple uh, path. Yeah. So, but anyway, it went. It, it's a lot now. It goes yeah. back and forth. But I, you know, I use it uh, to produce. Uh, if there are sessions, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do that. And yeah. uh, you know, Quincy Jones is a very smart man. Oh yeah. So I've been uh, very. I'm segueing back. Uh, it's okay because I, I want to touch on Quincy because he's like impacted my life so much. Just I mean, first of all, just as a music lover, and then when he uh, backed Jam Card, that was a, a really big deal for us too. You know. Yeah. Um. So, what was the best lesson Quincy Jones ever taught you? Oh God. Well, this was, you know, I had I became his drummer in '79, and I did everything. Even though he would branch out and do some you know, uh, older legend cats and some big band stuff without me. But uh, even to this year, he's turning 90. I know. And there's a rumor that we're doing a concert in Los Angeles. I've heard the rumor. Okay, so I'm uh, praying that... Uh, I, I did get a call, but it's not an official call, but I got a call from upstairs, so... I got a call, too. Oh. Can I use your did drum you? set? Can I share your drum set? Yes. Yeah. If you can play that Axis pedal. <laughs> Is it really light? It's it's amazing. <laughs> Digressing into pedals. <laughs> what song do you want to play? None of my shit, so no, we're going to have to find somebody else. Definitely not. If you, no, no. I do, think, do like some Grady Tate shit. Or I think something. they're going to want me to do one of the hip-hop modern things real then quick. do that. that moment. Yeah. No, you do. I'm not doing the you. You do you better than I could ever do you. Okay. Well, uh, I, also, I do want to sit side stage and watch you do you, though, just like... Oh, it'll be... Well, okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I pray that, that that comes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and his health holds. And, yes. You know, but... All right, so... He said so many things to me. He always used to say... You know, I was like, you know, as this skinny, long-haired basketball player. You know, that's what I was. And, and uh, he always used to say to me... I'm going to make you a star. JR, I'm going to make you a star. You just, because I look where I go, I, I didn't even know what that meant. You know, and then once I moved to Hollywood, it's like, oh, 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 there's some other <laughs> shit going on here. <laughs> I wasn't really concerned with that. Like, yeah. like maybe acting and, and doing other stuff and stuff. But um, um, he, we're, we, we started touring in 81 and we toured Japan and we played Budokan. And it was just, and there's, uh, you can see it on my Facebook or on on uh, YouTube. You can see that concert. It's just phenomenal. Who are you touring with? In it was Quincy Jones. Oh, with with Quincy Jones. It was a Quincy act. Jones. Yeah. Oh my God! You know, it was Patty Austin, James Ingram, Lewis Johnson, Greg Fillingains, Toots Thielemann, uh Jerry Hay, uh, Rod Temperton. Uh, uh, so sick. It was, uh, it was and me, and it was, it was just great. So that was when I f got my first Yamaha drum set. Wow. Which was another just, oh, it's Christmas! Yes. And, and blah, blah, blah. So next year we're touring, and I toured with him and Glenn Fry that year. I wanted to play some rock and roll, you know, like real simplistic stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't play any, don't, don't, don't even fill. Anyway. Let Glenn shine. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, but learn Henley's parts. Okay. <laughs> anyway. We're playing the Superdome in New Orleans. And I don't know if you've been there. Yes. It's just, you know, oh, yeah. just vintage, funky yeah. football stadium. And uh, it's sold out. And we, we're on stage. 
Right, right, I come out on stage and I'm checking the people out and it's, you know, it's almost filled up. And Quincy goes, JR, come here, man. And he goes, see those people way up there? And I thought he was going to say that they, they knew me and you know, they wanted to talk to me or something. He goes, they don't give a fuck what you play on your hi-hat. And he turned around and walked off the stage. <laughs> and I'm going, whoa, I just got Quincy'd. Yeah. And he, in other words, he did not want me playing all this fancy shit. Right. Like certain drummers we have seen are playing all this hi-hat activity. Yeah. Where in reality, all you really want is, is kick and snare drum. Yeah. Uh, to, to get through the song. And so lesson learned. Wow. And, and you know, it, it just ghosted me, just walked right off. Ah, uh, okay. Did I, got, it hurt? I got it. Did it hurt? No, it didn't. I was yeah. like, but maybe I wanted to see somebody up there. Yeah, exactly. No, like, <laughs> well, he kept calling you. Yes, he did. For many, many years. And yes, for many, he, yeah. <laughs> many of the biggest opportunities. You know, there was times where I didn't even move the drum set. Just kept it there. That's so cool. Well, it was cool, That's except so for cool. Cartage. You know, they didn't, yeah, yeah, they didn't yeah. make any dough. But. That's for, eh. You can't always worry about the cartridge making no, there. No, I do, though. Oh, know. okay, okay. Yeah. What were those demos like? Like, what is a Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson demo? Like, when they call you in, or are you just writing on the spot? There's some programming, maybe, or some keys. Well, parts. in the early days, demos were on cassette. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak about this in, in my book, because I, I saw a lot of good and bad come from people's demos. Yeah, yeah. But, um you know, in the off the wall days, and I got to go back here in my brain. Um, what was um, like? I mean, the very first two songs I did was "Girlfriend" by Paul McCartney, and the second song was "It's the Falling in Love" by Carol Bear Sager and David Foster, who I I didn't know who they were. Yeah, and the wow. "Girlfriend" song was really poppy. Girlfriend, it's like, and I'm just like you know, just kind of playing easy, but I'm grooving. And and uh, I think that demo was already on two inch. Really? In other words, they go, we don't want you to hear the drums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go, I don't want to hear the drums. Yeah. Just give me the song. I charted the song out and played it. Yeah. And that was the same with the second song. And then w once we got into the next Monday and did Don't Stop Till You Get Enough, it, all I remember is Greg Finnegan sitting at a, a Rhodes and a Mini Moog and me. And I don't remember anybody else. And that room was filled with people. That's how wow. focused it was. And I think that was, um, there was no demo. It was, I think, already existing. Um, I believe, yeah, it had to have been existing with the uh, Yuri 7 frame click. Wait, those were the first three sessions you did with Quincy? He brought you in on Paul McCartney first? Holy crap. Yeah. Well, listen, that was... And then David Foster, who you ended up working well, with for years, and then... Don't forget, back up before that, Quincy produced Rufus, Rufus. and Shaka Khan, right. uh, which was... A, Monster Jam. Do, uh, Master Jam. Master Jam, excuse uh, me. Monster Jam actually is yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, with a Do You Love What You Feel, and, yeah. and I actually had a song on that record, but... Uh, so he he kind of was comfortable with what was going on. He knew you already. He was yeah. like, he's had this guy. Well, he goes, hey, man, you went to Berkeley too, man. You know, I went to Berkeley, and it was called Schillinger House. <laughs> like, yeah, I went to Berkeley, and it was Berkeley. Wow. You know, but blah. So, so, yeah. he, so he did that with you, and that was, that was how you met him. I met him Rufus before that, actually. Uh, I met him in 78 at, at a concert in Los Angeles. Hmm. Uh, it was uh, called the Klaus Oger, Oberman, Ogerman called the Orchestra. Hmm. And it was, it was like all these L.A. finest players playing at Dorothy Chandler, and I was invited yeah. by management, to, and I sat right by him. Wow. And it was kind of orchestrated. Yeah, yeah. And when I was a little kid, I was trying to get into his jazz camp, but it was like up in South Dakota, and it was, my dad goes, I'm not driving you up there. You know, so I could never get to his camp. Wow. So, but, but your first time working with him, the opportunity came from Rufus and Shaka, yeah. which then made him be like, hey, come do this with me. And it's Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney. Holy crap. And then it's David Foster, who you end up working with for- And until, then Carol Bear now. Sager, who yeah. was married to Burt Bacharach, which wow. got me with Burt. And then it's Don't Stop Till You Get Enough? Yeah. Holy and, shit. And, and Greg, <laughs> Greg and I are looking at each other after we got through it. And we looked and we go, we, we just cut a number one record. Yeah. We knew. And everybody's like yelling, like, you know, the Lakers just won. Yeah. You know. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, it was it was, it was good times. That is amazing. Yeah. I heard a rumor that you got offered to do 
the thriller session, but you turned it down to do the Glenn Fry tour. Is that true? That is absolutely true. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> oh. This is, I got another uh, JR book story, but uh, again, plugging my future book. <laughs> um, 2024 gonna, is going to be here sooner than we know it. Well, I know that, uh, but uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll go in deeper uh, yes. about this, but um what was going on was um, I was introduced to Glenn Fry from Hawk, my partner, David Walensky, and uh, as you well know, wrote Ain't Nobody and wrote a whole bunch of stuff for Chicago and, um, and, and, and wrote Pitbull's most famous five notes. Bop, 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 bop. Uh, Huge. It came from a Street Player. Huge. Uh, Danny Serafin was co writer But anyway... Hawk introduced me to Glenn Fry, and Glenn was looking for a drummer to cut his solo record. And so I got a call, and I started working with Glenn Fry. And it was like, well, you know, it's, this is a completely different kind of mindset playing three note chords and no substitutions and no syncopation. But then Glenn was gearing himself to leave Dawn. And what happened was the Eagles broke up after the long run. And um, I was being courted, as I said, from Glenn. I was sitting at the end of the Lakers bench, got to know, meet uh, Norm Nixon and I were close. And I eventually got to meet Magic Johnson and Kareem. I actually met Kareem through Quincy. And um, I was just a major. Uh, and then Worthy and I were really close. And I, I became... Uh, just it was just great, and I was just such a Lakers fan, and, and especially all the way through '87 when when we showed those Celtics who's boss, you know, and so he was courting me. I mean, I got to go to the World Series, I got to do all this great stuff with Glenn, and um, then we went to uh, join. He asked me to join his band, so I go, when is it? And it happened to be in. It was starting to go on the road in 82. Well, I had two weeks in my book, and back then it was analog books, which I still use, and I had two weeks with Quincy Jones, or pro probably Michael Jackson. But you would, and, just, you would just know it was Quincy. Yeah. You were it, just told, hey, Quincy it was needs Quincy. you for two was, weeks. You don't know we, the artist. We, we yeah. figured it was, we heard rumors. It was Michael. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. Michael, and we didn't know what it was. And at the same time, the Glenn Fry thing came through yeah. with Irving Azoff. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, you know, I've already done a whole bunch of really hip Michael stuff. And, um, you know, including then I got Diana Ross and Lionel and out of that. And then, okay, now this, this white rock and roll world shows up. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm a white guy from Iowa, and I, but I'm always funky and big man oriented. But even though I probably would have loved to have played with Jimi Hendrix in that band. Hell yeah. That was kind of who I was. And uh, I ended up playing in the Iowa big band when I was a kid, so I was playing with all these old guys. But I said to Glenn, I go, I I'm going to do this. He goes, well, you're making a really good choice. And so I joined the Glenn band. I had to let the Quincy people know I can't do this. And, um, you know, there are rumors that there's still grooves that are on that record. Uh, not those two hits, though, because one is in Dugo and the other is Jeff. Mm -hmm. But there are other songs, mm -hmm. but whatever. And so I went out and played rock and roll with Glenn Fry, and we opened up, well, we headlined, and then we opened up for Fleetwood Mac. Amazing. And that was a whole other world. Well, Probably some really great times there. Here's the question, and I, and I bring this up. Does one stay in that direction, or does one try to get the best out of a new direction to help the career. So I chose the latter. Mm. Out of that, I became musical director for John Fogarty in 85, Amazing. which was hell <laughs> because we couldn't play any Creedence tunes. Oh. We were being sued, but I was highly compensated. For sure. Uh, I got um, all these other records out of it. I got Bob Seger's Like a Rock after Russ Kunkel called me and said, Hey, I got to go. Can you finish the record? I go, okay. So I go in and start working with Punch Andrews and Bob Seger and that band and didn't get that single, but I did seven songs in that record. 
they wanted all deep fat snares and 25 takes per song. Oh my God. It was hell. Again, so I got that. Then I got, <laughs> then I got um, uh, Stevie Nicks out of it. I was in that band for two weeks, which was incredibly wild. And then uh, I got, there's all, the, all these Warners connects because we were signed to Warners yeah. with Rufus. And after that, I got the, uh, there was a George, another George, couple of George Benson records because I had done Gimme the Night originally in 80, but we did a bunch of more records. And then and then I got Steve Winwood's record. Wow. Oh, no, before that. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I got uh, David Lee Roth's Crazy from the Heat record. <laughs> and that came about, I got a call, and this, again, all Warner Brothers. So I'm like, named six records now, yeah. maybe seven. Ted Templeman called me at my home. And I go, Jared, yeah, it's Ted. Ted, how you doing? So I used to work for La Puma and all, Michael Marty and all, Russ Tideman, all the Warners producers. And um, it was like a family. Ted goes, you want to go to New York? I go, yeah, what do you got going? He goes, well, you can't say anything to anybody. I go, what is it? He goes, we're going to do David Lee Roth's solo record in New York at, at Power Station. I go, oh. Oh, I'm in. <laughs> I go, what about my drums? Well, fly. Normally, cats, when they go to New York, you just use cartage. For sure. I go, fuck that. So they, uh, we set my, flew my drums. Wow. First class, put me up in the, whatever the hell that rock hotel was. Uh, gave me Artie Smith, uh, drum tech. And um, when we got to New York, I did not know the magnitude of, of what was about to happen. We basically broke Van Halen up. Wow. To do this EP, which was Edgar Winter, uh, I think it was Eddie Martinez, I think Bob Mann, um, Willie Weeks on bass. Holy shit. And uh, uh, it was just smoking. But, Edgar Winter was in the band? Edgar Winter was in the arranger and Whoa. in the band and playing sax and keys. Wow. And uh, we did Easy Street and then we did Just a Gigolo and then we yeah. did California Girls. Yeah. And they were all, well, Easy Street was the number one, but the other two were number ones. And, and then it came back and I go, oh my God. And eventually David asked me to join the band, but he, <laughs> he said, well, you're just going to have to get divorced if you join this band. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm thinking, uh, that's probably not a good thing. Yeah. So that, then that's, you know, and then other people auditioned and blah, blah. So then after that, wow. then we did Steve Winwood, And then Steve Winwood became the greatest thing ever. Yeah. And I think Steve peaked as a writer. Yeah. At that point. And then after that, we were like in 87, 88. And anyway, so I, had, I, I just that look at, path. what did I get out of it if I had stayed? Yeah. And done Thriller. Yeah. Granted, Thriller is the biggest selling record of all time. Yeah. At, to this point. Yeah. But, you know, I'm already at close to a half a billion units sold. Yeah. Without it. Right. So it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you made the right... I would have made the same choice. Yeah. And I sure. learned a whole bunch about, you know, different kinds of music. You diversified yourself. A bit. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> I mean, to do the Glenn Fry tour and to be the headline dates and then to be supporting Fleetwood Mac in those days. Oh, they were on. Holy shit. They were on. Yeah. That's like the iconic rock story. I want to have incense on my bass drum. Yeah. Hell yeah. And then doing David Lee Roth with straight, like in Van Halen transition mode. And he was singing his butt off. Wow. A lot of people don't think he, they, you know, yeah. he, he, boy, he sang really well. Yeah. You know what, uh, you know, our mutual friend, you know, Christian James Hand. Yes. So I've heard a lot of the David Lee Roth vocal stems. Oh. Right. And I've heard your drum stems also. Really? He's got a bunch of them. I must have to have these. Yeah, you must email him. Or, 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 or g on. give me that. And yes. I, I wouldn't mind all those files. Yeah. Yeah, he's got a bunch of them. Not that he has legal right to them, but. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff's floating around. Like yeah, exactly. Everything. Um, so yeah, so that, that's cool. And that also shows me that you, you at that point became more of like you, you band oriented, even though with Rufus and everything, you were already doing that in your career early on. So you as you, you, you did band person and then you also were doing a uh, session musician, touring musician, music director, band person, kind of going back and family and, and family. trying to be a father. How on earth are you a father while doing, while doing that? Well, there was only one knock at the door. I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh no no um sorry 
Well, that was hard. Yeah. It was hard, especially when you're working. I mean, you know, in the A days, uh, we were working, running three drum sets a day. Yeah. Wow. You know, and it was like, okay. So you were bouncing around different studios, but and the three sessions a day, three three sessions, three at with three different drum sets. No way, all my, all my own. So we had to clone stuff. Wow. Yeah, and and you know the guys in the '60s were doing that. Yeah, yeah. But you know, in, in the '80s, uh, that that happened. Yeah, and it was great. That's so cool. You know, but you know you have to. Oh shit! I got to drive from here to get to the west side. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, I just made it. Yeah. Know? But wow. I, but that was, those were good days. Yeah. So you're doing that. So you're just, I mean, you're just grinding and you have two young kids. They were young. Point. Yeah. Yeah. At that point. And you were going on the road also. Was, uh, yeah. And I'd stopped. Let's see. I'd stopped going on the road. I tried not to go in the road in the late eighties. Yeah. You know, trying to do the best I could do. But, you know, I ended up like hanging out with Joe Sample and, and I, I was a member of the Crusaders for two weeks. Wow. Uh, which was really weird, and um, but Joe and I hung, and I wrote some stuff with Joe, but um, I didn't really go on the road. And, I mean, in the early days uh, with Stanley Clark and George Duke, yeah, I did those first two records. But wow, they did not put me on that cover, and, uh, and there was there was three different record labels involved, and I go, well, whatever, you know. I mean, put you I, on the cover, but but we did SNL in season six. Which is an interesting story, but I, I may save that for the book. Other than you can see that online. Okay, <laughs> but I was in that band for a second live, right? And we did a gig in New Orleans, and um, drum tech. There it is. Um, uh, we did a gig in New Orleans, and the three of us were clocked at 130 decibels. Whoa! I mean, I I, I don't even believe that. But the guy goes, you guys were 130 dB. And I go, that's some loud shit, man. That's more than an for, airplane taking off right a, over a, your head. A trio. Right? Yeah, that's so, crazy. So there was selected bands in the Fogarty, and Steve wanted me to go on the road, and I just couldn't go. Mm-hmm. Lionel wanted me to go on the road. Michael initially wanted me to go on the road, and I just didn't want to go. Yeah. You know, I was still, I had allegiance to Rufus. Yeah. Praying that maybe something would happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what did happen was... Uh, Stomping at the Savoy record. Yeah, yeah. So, but Amazing. then, you know, time to grow up and move on. So, and with that being said, so now you're back with your band, your new band. I got a new band. You're, ba- you're back and you're in the band chair. I, man, Belushi came to me and he goes, we're putting the band back together. <laughs> but you're like, I'm starting the band. <laughs> that's, that's right. And speaking of start, S-R-T. And it's almost it. It's almost it. Yeah, yeah. And, well, you know, we... we it's, it, it's an interesting story. Uh, a couple of years ago, I decided to try to put a Rufus clone band together mm-hmm. with a, a, a young girl that sounded like Shaka, but could sing all my hits. I'd sing the Pointer Sisters, sing uh, Lionel, sing uh, Whitney. Whitney is very hard, and Shaka mm-hmm. is really hard. And I found a girl named Allison Nash. And uh, so I put this together with Mitch Town, my, my B3 player. Yeah. Uh, and we played a club in Omaha called The Jewel, which is uh, owned at, by my manager, Brian mm. McKenna. And um, we, we hyped it up and did it, and we sold out. And it was huge. Amazing. But at that same point, I realized this is really hard trying to get a band and keep a band yeah. and pay a band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and get gigs. And so Mitch, uh, Mitch goes, man, do you want to do a trio record? And I go, and Mitch is a lot like Joey DeFrancesca, God bless mm. his soul, but more funky and rock. Yeah. However, still blows bop. And um, he's like the number one cat in the Midwest. So we start talking and we're talking and go, we need to find the right guitar player. So we, we went through a bunch of names. And uh, and then all of a sudden I realized, well, I've been playing with this guy, Andrew Sinewick, mm-hmm. who is the next coming of Studio Kings. You know, he plays like, you know, Dean Parks and Jeff Beck, God bless him, and and, and uh, George Benson, he yeah. has all these characteristics. And uh, and he can read, he's from the University of Miami. He's younger, he's a good looking guy. He's got his own style, plays in time and plays the right notes and he's innovative. So um, I go, this is the guy. Yeah. So we started getting together and started writing and we came up with a record and we recorded the record about six months ago, five, and we're gonna unveil that this year. And uh, now we've gone into Drum Channel with Don yep. Lombardi and recorded three new tunes. Nice. Well, and what ties in with this trio, there's no bass player. 
which is very interesting. So you mic the Leslie a, a correct way to, to get the bass and make it pump, and it's like very hip. That's so cool. But it's more rock and funk and, and, and hipper jazz. Um, so we went in with Don, and uh, we had management had a, a, an idea, which was actually our idea too, to come up with redo staying alive. So cool. Which has been redone what ten thousand times. Yeah. And I go, what are we going to do? So we SRT'd it, make this really hip arrangement that uh, Andrew and, and Mitch came up with, and I suppose me too. And <laughs> and 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 um, the tie-in is that Andrew and I played on the movie um, Bullet Train with uh, what his name is. Um, Brad Pitt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Staying alive. That's awesome. So we're tying that in, but we made it really hip. And then we, we've done one version of it with us, uh, you know, the organ and the guitar doing the melody. Yeah. Then our second version is going to be one of your boys, Jonah Nielsen, that's going to do the vocals with all his hip harmonies <sighs> underneath this melody. With But it's like syncopated. It's funky. Yeah. And when people hear it, they're going to go, holy shit. And so we did that. We did a Rufus Tong song that Ray Parker wrote called You Got the Love. And we did a new song called Insomnia, which is kind of like a, oh, I don't know how we'd say a Mike Stern Holdsworth kind of vibe. Nice. And so that's we're determining what may make the record, even though our record's mastered and done, we may pull something and add something. So this is new stuff that you recorded at Drum Channel. We just did it two weeks ago. Because you, because I saw the concert that you guys did with Drum Channel. That was uh, a month or so, two yeah. five weeks ago, right for the fiftieth, which was awesome. Yeah, it was yeah. that was fun. Yeah, you know? and was that your first show as a band? Yes. That's awesome. Documented. Yeah, yeah it, it was documented. Yeah. And, you know, I was playing on a uh, McLaren, by the way. Really? Those drums. Ooh. Of course. Oh. Of course. Yeah, of course. John, John Good. Some Ooh, sort baby. of John Good founded at the bottom of the ocean stuff. Oh, that, yeah. No, shells, I, I don't crazy. have that. <laughs> I, I, he, he's my dear friend, by the way. That, yeah, you, Hi, you have a long relationship with DW, right? Like, you guys... Yeah, you I mean, Don I, Lombardi and John Good. And I, I was, you know, I was always Yamaha artist, you know, but they they were really patient. Mm -hmm. I almost went over in '87, mm. and but that's when Hoggy was still developing stuff for me personally, and yeah. I go, oh, this is not right. And I, I talked to those guys. They go, you know, competition's good. You know, just come over when it's time, or if it is. Wow, they were very very nice. That's and, confident and playing long ball. And the, those two were the kings of the world yeah, for you know? sure. And then you know Yamaha kind of slid, and DW rose. Yeah, and now DW is on fire. They're the yeah. and now Roland is involved, which is really happening. Oh right, Roland bought DW right. So it's just all I can say is. Future looks bright. Yeah, I love it. And Roland's a great company. They're unbelievable. Company. Yeah, and they're know. educationally yeah. based. Yeah, you know, which is I'm all about. I'm actually about to meet Chris for the first time, Lombardi. Oh, you'll I love him. I haven't met him yet. We have a meeting set. Yeah, um, I'm excited to meet him. Oh, you'll love him. Yeah, love him. and Don, you know, is just legend. You Don's know? the man. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one one side note, because you brought up Russ Kunkel. Yes. I don't know if you know this, but jam, uh, we have a Jam Card film coming out. Our first documentary. And it's called the Immediate Family, and it's, really, and it's on Russ and Leland Sklar, really, and Wadi, and the whole, yeah, the and whole, Cooch, and, and and Cooch is like the main, yeah. I mean, they're they're all equally, main. yeah, but yeah, Danny's in it, yeah, yeah. yeah. oh yeah, yeah, of course, it's 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 them, yeah, yeah, it's them, it's it's their story. I'm very proud of those guys. Yeah. Actually, on Saturday, if you're around, yeah, I know that there's a there's we're a doing thing. the screening, yeah, 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 at yeah. United. I uh, I've got an invite. I'm not sure if I can uh, do it because I'm getting ready to go on the road. But uh, oh right, right. But that's a jam card film. Is it's it? Our, it's our first documentary. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We have like two two documentaries that we're working on right now. Fantastic. And one of them is 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 Russ and Danny and Wadi and and Leland, and it's amazing. Yeah, I, I see Russ a lot when he when, when he comes up and you know he stays with John because I live like four minutes from John. Nice. You know, so it's it's all really close. He's the best man. He's such a sweetie. Oh, he's he's, he's you know, he's the he's the wood god. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So I'm mean, I'm just really blessed to be able to play uh drums that respond. It's mm. I mean it's I always compare it to like driving a McLaren. Yeah. You know, because that's what they are. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. So okay, so when is this new SRT project gonna come out, the new album? The or the, al new or the singles? We're not sure of yeah. that of that direction. Um, but um the plan I would say 
because uh, we're we're doing Birdland. Uh, nice. July, we're doing five nights at Birdland. Oh, awesome! July eighteenth. Is on. that the first like residency stint for the band? Uh, no, we're going to do before that in June twenty second. We're going to be at uh, Billboard Live in all three cities. Nice. Which would be Tokyo, uh, Hamamats, right? So are are you in Osaka? Do you plan on? Tickets selling from that because people know the new project and know the music, or is it more just like people that follow you? I that think kind of it's thing, it's and started they want with to see your new project. I think it may be that uh, because we still don't have our deal set with a record label, right? Right, and, and uh, which we are uh, very close to. Yeah, and but you know, in today's times with record labels, it's not really conducive conducive of that. But you know, we 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 have a brand. Yep. Uh, it's srtgroove.com if anybody wants to go there. Definitely. And, um, uh, and then that'll lead you to Instagram and all, all the other things. Um, so I was just at uh, Billboard Live with David, uh, I don't know, seven, eight months ago, and I kind of uh, talked to them about my trio, and they were incredibly interested And because uh, I've, I've been to Japan a lot. Yeah. And it's like, I can walk down the street and people will yell my name, which is like, oh my God. That's awesome. You know, here you go, shit, there's f- stalkers. <laughs> you know, or, or what do you work for? Never mind. But uh, it's less dangerous there. Yeah, less dangerous. It's, well, yeah, let's hope so. But yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're going to do that. That'll be our first residency. And then uh, we, we're going to do a whole bunch of gigs booked in, in, in around that. But it's all kind of around my David Foster schedule. Right. Uh, but it's working out really well. But the New York residency is. Very special. Birdland. And I'm going to bring Tom Scott in as a guest star. Nice. Because, and he has never played Birdland. Really? Yeah, you, you would have thought. And I'm going, well, this is, you know, he's going to be like a little kid in a candy store. I may I may have to make a little New York trip. I would love you to be Yeah, that would be, be there, awesome. You know, for one of the shows. Or I, listened, I listened to the whole Drum Channel concert. It's awesome. Thank you. I really, really dig it. Everyone should search that. It's on YouTube. Thank you. Um, and to see, because then you can then you can experience the evolution it is the evolution, oh, which is a beautiful record label out of London, by the way. Is it? Yes. Oh. Did I, did I hint to that? All right, never mind. Never. <laughs> We're going to cut that out of the podcast. Yeah, maybe not. I don't know. Um, what, what, a couple couple final things, and we and we can wrap. I know I'm taking a lot of your time. Thank it's you right. for it. It's Friday, baby. Let's see. We're just chilling today. That's right. Just kidding. We're in back to backs after this. All right, John. See, we're still grinding. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh my God. We I, actually made time in our busy schedule to have you. So thank you. Hey, and by the hey. way, I, I am very honored to have driven through this I 5 to get here. I thought you took the gondola. Uh, well, it was a gondola on the I 5. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, obviously, like, so we really just met in person right now and you're a very easy person to talk to. You're a very sweet guy. You're, you're personable. You're funny. You got all those things. So I'm assuming you have, you have a lifelong career of working with many different artists, many different personality types, oh boy. a lot of different egos uh, or uh, maybe shy people or, or what, whatever it can be, you know, the, the running the full gamut of like every personality <laughs> that could come within an artist right? Uh, or a producer or a songwriter right. right, or session players or whatever it may be. So, what is your secret besides just your obvious, I don't know, I, I guess I would take it off you that you're just like confident and cool and there's no ego and you're just here to have a good time and do the best job that you can. But like, what is your secret to like balancing those personalities? Because you didn't just also have experiences with these people. You had careers with all these people. Right. How did that like Oof. share share the secret? You know, I have to give my parents credit, God bless them, Jack and Helen. And uh, they... they um, you know, it was basically the Mason-Dixon War. Mm. My dad was from the north, my mother's from the south, so there was always a bit of a rub, but uh, I, I didn't understand what that meant. And, and But they taught me um, respect yeah, and listening, and listening to people, which is still something I work at every single day, to listen, even at this age. Mm. and Because there's like so many things that maybe are said but not absorbed. And so that's what I'm doing. So if I were to work with George Martin, Mm -hmm. for example, which I had the great luxury of working with him twice. One, I don't even remember what the hell the project was. I was just going to say, what were the George Martin One was a a, a Kenny Rogers record. Really? It was fantastic. Wow. Uh, Who was George Martin But he was just, I mean, he was so well-educated, so well 
spoken. Yeah. And 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 all ears. Yeah. And then when he wanted to say something, it was like, oh my God. It, it wasn't like you were, you know, it wasn't like, uh, I don't know, you know, we, when we first heard Bonham right. or something, he was just speaking. And yeah. It was like, great. But, or, or working with Quincy, my yeah. mentor. Yeah. You know, and, and Quincy has his own kind of vernacular that yeah. if you, if you listen, you understand what he's saying. Yeah. Or, um, um, Herbie. Yeah. And I've had the great fortune. I've never toured with Herbie, um, but I've played with Herbie live and in the studio many times. And, you know, it's like a little quick story. We're, we're doing, we're doing something on Off the Wall, and, and I think also bad. And Bruce Swedeen comes up. He goes, you know, Herbie's coming down. And, uh, you know, he lived in the Bay Area, and he was coming down, and, and he's making, uh, we, hear, hear what he's, we heard what he's making. And all of us are freaked out. And then Bruce would look at all of us in the band, including Luke the Third, and goes, none of you guys ever charge Quincy more than double scale, even though Herbie's making that. And I'm going, well, we don't want to be Herbie. Yeah. But it didn't matter. Because when he got on the piano, there, there were times where I would look at him and I'm going, you know, you're playing, all, you're playing too much shit on this track. And he goes, yeah, you're right. He goes, let me simplify. So he would be nice yeah. and listen. And then, you know, out of that, we would work together and, and do things. But it's just about the professionalism and respect of, of players. Now, granted, there were the opposite of that. There were producers that were nuts, producers that would throw chairs. Yeah. Go, these are all going to go unnamed right now, but they'll be in the book. Oh. Um, Light them up. Yeah. No, I, have to, I have to be positive in the yeah. book okay maybe maybe we'll see yeah uh and the, and and musicians that i remember working with a famous producer musician i'll just say this he, he was a keyboard player go unnamed that we got called for a julio iglesias session that david was probably producing and it was all contracted and there was two keyboard players reading parts and the one keyboard player took me aside and he goes, J.R., I, I can't read this. I go, let me see your part. And it was all really high, up of octave, high string notes. And, you know, it's hard to read up there. Yeah. And, and he just, he came up to me, he goes, I just, I got to go. And he left. And I'm going, oh, boy. And so I explained to the other keyboard player in the rhythm section, and then I think it was David or somebody, this guy bailed, and uh, yeah, it's all right. You you can overdub the part, you know. But you know, just seeing different players come through, and um, and learning and growing from from all of them, you right? Know? And trying to get the best. And I guess the words team, you know, get the team result. Yeah. Being a team player, it's a concept. Yeah. You know, and then there's other famous cats that we love that are just soloists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which will, you know, I'm not going to mention them. They got their own sound, their own signature, their own style. They're known for it. You'll deal with it because you want that. Yeah, or not. <laughs> you don't want that, but you want that. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. I could talk to you for hours no, we'll, and hours. We'll do, a, we'll do a follow-up. I'm down to do a follow-up. We got to do it when the book comes out. We got to do the promo. Oh, I would love you to do the promo. We got to do the promo. There's, there's, so much, there's so much in this. We, we've, we've had a great time. Yeah. We've had a great time. Uh Thank you, bro. It's my, my pleasure. So thank good. you for having me. Oh, dude, thank and you. And thanks to the crew. I appreciate it. All right, so John J.R. Robinson, SRT. Check it out. Be on the lookout. It's coming. You can watch the Drum Channel performance now, and then be, be uh, on, follow them and for the updates on the dates, for the tour dates, for the live, and then for all the new songs. And big shouts to Jonah Nelson coming on it. Jonah Nelson, SRTGroove.com. SRTGroove.com. And also thank you, Quincy Jones, just for changing both of our lives. That's right. He... <laughs> he's the man and uh this is his year actually yes this is big happy this birthday is, yeah. to quincy jones yeah. turning 90 this year yep maybe just a baby just a young baby and still impacting the world still got his finger on the pole still right. supporting the most innovative people and everyone in the in the in the young generation everything he's doing with jacob collier that's right and everything right now as well as i mean there's there's a million projects but much love to quincy jones we love you yeah and hey. cheers hey cheers buddy my guy my, my pleasure. Thank you.